the big silence, empowering personal experiences, inspiring compassion, and healing lives. We are no longer silent. We are here. The big silence. Hello and welcome to the Big Silence Podcast. I am your host, Karina Dawn. I'm a mental health advocate, wellness entrepreneur, and co-founder of the leading women's fitness community, Tone It Up. I'm also a New York Times bestselling author and founder of the nonprofit, The Big Silence Foundation. I'm also a wife, daughter, friend, and yes, palm mom of five. And just like you, I'm a work in progress. I have experienced profound grief and trauma and then found deep joy in life. And now I'm here to share my story, be a safe space for you to share yours. And we're having in-depth conversations with psychologists, doctors, spiritual leaders, friends, and others who have been impacted directly or indirectly by a mental health condition. No more embarrassment, no more shame, no holding back, only healing. Let's go. Mental health is my wealth, the stress up on the shelf. Nobody can love me the way I love myself. See, can you shall find the truth and the light? I'm living my purpose, so I sleep good at night. No more depression or spiritual recession. And every day that I wake up, it's a blessing. So breathe in, breathe out. Everybody in the house know what I'm talking about. The big silence. The big silence. Don't fall backwards. Can somebody stand back here? They'll never know what will mount to Well, hello, everybody. Hello, crew. If you're just grabbing drinks or snacks, you can come back to the lawn uh, for our conversation that I'm going to have with Karina, which I'm so excited about. And for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Krista Williams. I'm one half of Almost 30 Podcast, which is a community that supports women in their evolution. It was started by my best friend and I about six years ago. And we're like the personal growth, the little versions of Tone It Up. And we've been dear friends with Karina and Katrina for years. They've been such inspirations to us. So we're really excited to be here today to have a deep, intimate conversation about her book that she wrote together. So we might be a little bit emotional. There probably will be tears. We're going to get a little deep after we did the movement and meditation. So I hope you all are ready for it. Let's do it. Who's ready for it? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Who has? You guys all have the book too, right? Okay, yes. perfect. Oh, and then when I asked Krista to have this conversation here, she's like, is there anything you don't want me to talk about? I said, nah, it's all freaking in the yes. book. <laughs> I was actually reminded because I was like, hey, you know, with any conversation that gets like this, you say, you know, is there anything you don't want us to talk about? Anything that feels off limits? And I was reminded when I was rereading the book, I'm like, yeah, there's nothing off limits here. <laughs> there is truly nothing off limits in this book. And when I first received it, I cannot tell you how blown away and surprised I was at the depth and journey that you've gone through. Um, We on my podcast, we have so many different inspiring stories and people that come on and really share the depths of their soul. But this felt so different and this felt so real. And I've known you for five or six years now. And to know how much you've been through and how much you remembered and how much you shared, I'm so impressed by you. And I'm so honored to be your friend. I look at you I've always admired you, but to know the strength of your story has just meant so much to me. So thank you. And I just want to put out there. Remember, do you remember coming to the Tone It Up office? Yes. And you were the first podcast Kat and I ever did. Yes. (laughs) We were their first podcast. We came into the Tone It Up office. You guys were shooting skinny dipped almonds. (laughs) They were shooting a brand in the corner at the offices. And I was like so in awe. I was like, I want to have my own office and shoot skinny dipped almonds in the corner (laughs) and eat skinny dipped almonds. And we had our very first interview with you two together. So I want to dive into this conversation. I would love to start with a section um, that you wrote in your book just to sort of ground us in. And you don't know. She doesn't know what section I've picked. So let's do it. So Karina says, as my mom became more delusional, I felt more torn. My foundation had been shattered, crushed. My psyche felt ripped into a thousand pieces. I couldn't trust my dad anymore because mom turned me against him. I couldn't trust my mom because she screamed and yelled at me when I walked, when I talked back to her. And then in the next minute, she confided in me like I was an adult. As for Rachel, she escaped to her own world and mostly kept her frustrations to herself. She was into reading and writing and that's how she coped. I knew she was hurting too. 
She ended up doing drugs too, but didn't confide in me. Her pain was too deep, too intimate. I became, I began drinking liquor by the time I was 12. And not long after I started smoking cigarettes, alternating between New, Newport lights and camels. I looked, I thought I looked cool and sophisticated like the ads of stylish women in magazines who pose with cigarettes in their fingers while talking to handsome lung men. I was slowly sliding into rebellion. There was nothing I could do to control the situation in my home. So the one thing I can control was the way I behaved outside my home. Whew. And I just felt like the part and especially just really grounding us in the journey of your mom's mental health and how torn of an experience it was and how much it really can bring up for someone that's in such a pivotal period in their life. So you're crying already. We're crying. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. And I, I, I say this publicly, like I just, I cry so much more now because I'm so proud of the girl I've become, the woman I've become to be able to take this story of someone who could have ended up on the streets of Skid Row downtown and bless everyone there, but turn their life around to something great, finding physical movement, meditation, healing naturally, and then realizing there was something greater in me. And now in this journey, being able to spread the message because I feel like I've overcome so much and I'm an expert in the space of like, you matter, you can do anything. I... I thought I would never become any, like not saying anyone, but just yeah. any su success or just being alive. I didn't think I would live past my 20s. Yeah, and it's really powerful too because Tone It Up is was originally about a healthy body. You know, it was like feeling good in your body, movement, friendship, and connection. And it's so interesting because you're, that is so much of your story, but there's such an interesting part of your story that we're now learning now about mental health and the importance of mental health. And I know with Tone It Up, it wasn't something you always talked about. Can you talk a little bit about that, of your journey of feeling like it might be something that you had shame around? Yeah. I mean, even Kat and I, and Kat knows my entire story, but we're talking over a decade ago where no one wanted to talk about mental health. It was shamed. So even to Kat, I was like, no one can know that this fitness superstar is, you know, did drugs in her past or had a mother that was schizophrenic and suffered from depression. It was so bad. And so then finally, as I brought meditation into Tone It Up and in the app and said, you know what? screw it. I'm talking about this because it was healing for me to start talking about like what's going on in my family, what I've been through. Yes, I attempted suicide as a 13-year-old. Yes, I had this chaotic family. But once you start talking about it, then the healing begins. And even with, yeah, I mean, the healing begins. And it, it started even when I started writing the book. I was like, breathe in, breathe out. I could take a breath. It's out there. There's no more secrets. Yeah. And I think we can all relate to those parts of our story or our journey that we have so much shame around and we feel like no one can relate to and we feel like we're so alone. And that's really the journey of shame to really get us to feeling alone, to get us to feeling like we're the only one. So for you to step into that power of owning your story is so so impressive. And you mentioned this, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this, but there was a suicide attempt that you had. Um, what was that experience like? And do you feel like that was a wake up call or do you feel like it really sunk you deeper into the, the depths of your, your soul? Um, number one, whoever on my team, just somehow there's a, <laughs> some tissues here. Thank you. <laughs> um, without going into the details of it, it is in the book. Um, it wasn't a wake up call at that age because we're talking in the nineties, right? Where no one was talking about it. I was ashamed. It happened. I was in the hospital. Um, I was out of school for over a week. And even when I showed back up at school, I was embarrassed. I, like, what are people saying? But no one really talked about it. But back then it wasn't a wake up call because nobody was talking about it and nobody 
got me into therapy. Nobody, you know, I found out, you know, my mother would be missing for months at a time or weeks at a time or going, you know, just disappearing. And I found out she was diagnosed paranoid schizophrenia and I had to go to a library because no one, oh, she's schizophrenic. Like, what is that? Went to a library and rented out a book and read it all to understand what was happening in my family and in my life. So um, it wasn't a wake-up call. I didn't have a wake-up call until my early 20s. Early 20s on a three-day bender in Hollywood. And, As you do. <laughs> right? As you do. L.A. Um, and I just realized I'm either going to die or be something greater. And that was the time that I found what I loved most, which was physically moving my body and started surfing, getting into triathlon. And I was like, Karina, you know what? You're better than this. And I made that shift. Yeah. And with your, with it, it's the small step. So it's, you know, hearing the voice and taking note. And then it's like, I'm going to move my body, moving your body one day, moving your body another day, eventually finding Katrina, eventually surfing, doing the triathlons. Would you say that your first step was starting to move your body to your healing? Or what would you suggest for someone that feels like they struggle with mental health to make the step forward in their journey? There's so many different layers to mental health. And for myself, I thought I was going to become my mother because my mother you know, was schizophrenic and her father was schizophrenic and committed suicide. And I just assumed I would become like them. But it was that moment when I decided I'm, it's not me. And I thank God every day that it skipped a generation. And with my sister too, executive director, Rachel over there, <laughs> um, we're so blessed to not have the mental health disease. Um, what was the question? Sorry, I just well, like, no. <laughs> I'm like I get, what would I be get, the first step for first someone? Step. Yeah, realizing that you're worthy because I think there's a lot of shame and feeling not worthy in a lot of us. And of course, moving my body and realizing when was I last happy was running a half marathon. And um, then those little tiny steps surrounding yourself with people who care and you can connect with. I had to change my my circle of friends for sure. And making those healthy choices, journaling, going to therapy. I read every self-help book out there. Um, uh, it's just these, all these tiny steps and realizing not being a victim. I think one of the important things is being like, I'm not a victim of this. This is happening for me, not to me. And now I'm able to be here with all of you and saying, it didn't happen to me. Even on my, I was with my mom her last three days, last September in hospice. And I told her what a wonderful mother she was by not even being able to be present because she raised a daughter that I'm proud of. Mm. Love you, babe. Yeah, I think I loved what you said about happiness, too, because I think so many of us can get caught up in, you know, I'm, I'm not happy. I'm not feeling happy with my life. And we sort of get in that mentality of not feeling satisfied or happy with our life. But really having that opportunity to be like, OK, when was the last time I was happy? How can I move closer to that? When is a memory where I felt truly happy or satisfied? And how can I move closer to that feeling? Um, the journey of her passing and the grief that comes up when you have a parent or someone in your life that has mental health or an addiction, it is so complicated to lose someone because this person has caused you so much pain. And this person has been really a part of your life. That's been so challenging and traumatic. What was the journey of the grief process for you of losing her? And how were you able to be in that higher self state of knowing that this was someone that had changed your life in a positive way and you could love her through it, even though she had caused you so much pain? The process was very interesting because again, no one was telling me how, how do you process grief? Has anyone here, we're all young, lost a parent at a young age. 
there's no no book, no playbook on that, right? You're like, I'm here. And how do I manage that? And especially because my mother, um, I was basically her parent since I was 12 years old. And then again, the last five years of her life, it was trying to figure out how to move through this. And then also because I dealt with her doctors every day and I, I, I managed her life. I had, you know, got her home and um, dealt with her doctors and everything. It was like all of a sudden when she passed, it was like, what is life? And then there are a lot of people who are like, well, Karina, you're still grieving. You got to get over. I'm like, no, it's like I lost my child, <laughs> which is my mother, lost my child, my mother. And I'm now figuring out how to move through life in a different way. But I've ta- been able to take that energy, which I'm so grateful for, to put it into the big silence. Like that energy and that passion that I had to help her is now here. And when we talked, you talked about, you know, one of your last conversations was around mental health. And she was finally able to accept, accept that as something that she struggled with. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I've been doing mental health advocacy for many, many, many years. And NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness, is here. They do have a table and they have counselors here. Uh, I've worked with them for a long time. Um, My mother found out about my advocacy and she was very upset at me for, for it because she was so afraid that everyone would think she was dangerous. And she was not. And again, there's so many different layers with mental health. Um, but on her last days, she, she said to me the day before she died, she said, it's not just my physical health, it's my mental health. And that's when I told her about the big silence and she nodded her head and smiled. Which is very powerful. You know, those moments where you can see someone connect to something that you've been so passionate about and really having that is so beautiful. Part of your healing and grieving process and being with her is forgiveness. And, you know, whether or not we have a mother or father that struggles as deeply as you did with mental health issues, we always have to learn to forgive our parents because there has been times in our life where they've let us down. They haven't been there when we wanted to be. So forgiveness is huge, whether it's our parents, relationships, or even self. What are some steps that you've taken to forgive her and how do you see forgiveness as playing a role in this? I'm huge on forgiveness. Um, I've had a few conversations like Terry Cole and Zach Williams on my podcast. (laughs) They're like, you don't want to be a forgiveness factory because then you attract more people that you have to forgive. But no, I actually still, even though everyone's opinions, I believe in forgiveness and acceptance and, and setting boundaries. It's the only way that I could get through life um, is to be able to say, I see you, I hear you, I allow, I have no judgment on anyone I forgive everything. And as long as you're just being a good fucking person and let everyone else have their things and forgive and love. I don't know. I just live in love. I honestly just live in love. Yeah. Acceptance is huge. It's a huge part of that. And you said boundaries. I think boundaries is like, we're all getting so excited about boundaries lately. It's like the whole, (laughs) everyone I know is like boundary obsessed because I feel like we're now really learning and empowering ourselves to create our own boundaries and to show up in a way that feels good for both us and other people. Can you tell us about your journey with boundaries and was boundaries something you did as a young girl or was it something that you learned earlier, later on in life? I don't think I learned boundaries until like five years ago, (laughs) which they're amazing. Uh, do you all know boundaries? Give me a woo hoo. Yes. <laughs> boundaries are amazing and it's not a bad thing. It's a self-respecting, self-love thing. Like I had like 30 friends that texted me today and they're like, I can't make it today. I'm like, you go. 
all good. <laughs> I'm not feeling it. My energy, I don't, you know, I think boundaries are beautiful as then, you know, as long you know, as they're, they have boundaries, have boundaries. <laughs> yes. Especially with, if you're a parent, if you're parenting a mother, you know, that's boundary is kind of lost. So reclaiming yourself and your authenticity and your identity is huge. I want to talk a little bit about the writing of the book and maybe the hardest chapter to write because I know you've been writing this for a long time. As long as I've known you, you've had the book in progress, in process. And book writing is very challenging. It's therapy. It's going through your memories. It's the archives. You know, so many of us are living with experiences that were really hard in our life and they're just sort of in our brain and our minds, but we don't recall them often. But to really bring up every single painful memory in your life and write it down in a book for the world to see is really challenging. So can you talk about maybe the hardest chapter that you had to write? Um, Yeah. So the book took me five years. I thought it was going to take a year, but the story in the universe and everyone was like, it's not, the story is not over yet. Uh, Hardest chapter. I had to write an epilogue. Um, after my mother passed, the originally the book ended where my mother was healthy. She was living in an idle wild. She was thriving. And that's where it ended. And then time passed and the story changed. So right after her passing, I had to write an epilogue. And that was the hardest. Um, and it was really hard to... Because so a lot, I, I interviewed my sister, Rachel, my dad, I, um, I have like 20 diaries, uh, um, journals from growing up where I would just write about my experience growing up and my poetry. So I have all of this, but, um, and then the entire writing process is tough because you have to relive it, but I have the tools to know how to relive it and then be healthy and be okay. But the epilogue. The epilogue is beautiful. And actually, my friend Jenna is over here. Um, Hello, Jenna. She helped me. Jenna's mother also suffers from mental illness. And she helped me sculpt to find the beauty in my mother and her story and how to give her praise. And I appreciate that. One thing that I love about this and you is owning your story. And I think all of us have our own stories, whether it's something that's really beautiful or challenging. We all have unique perspectives and stories. How would you suggest or how do you encourage people to own their story? I mean, who really cares about judgment? And now at this point, (laughs) you don't like me. You don't like my past. I'm, I'm a good person. I mean, I have said like when I opened up and the tone it up community and the big silence community, the women who have reached out and then shared their story, the two women, OG tone it up on the bus today. What I heard, like, we need to talk more. Like we need to stop being like, we're perfect because perfection is a prison. So share your story, share your love, because once you can get that out of you, you can live your life at the highest vibration. Mm. I love that. And Bobby has been such a support. He's been such an anchor for you. How has he been able to show you how to support someone with mental health? You know, maybe there's someone in your life that is struggling. Um, how has he been an example for you of how to support someone with a mental health, with mental health issues? So when Bobby and I started dating, like what, 10 years ago, Bobby, we still don't, I don't remember what year did we get married? I don't know. Um, (laughs) but as soon as we got married and got back from our honeymoon, all of a sudden my mom shows up and we talk about it, or I talk about it in the book and locks herself in her, in our house in Manhattan beach for a week. And Bobby had never met her before. And he was like, what is going on? I normalize mental disease. I normalize schizophrenia. I normalize depression and with everything with my mom. I'm like, oh yeah, she's just locked in there. So he was very confused and he was a great supporter and partner because 
he wanted to find out more about mental health. So we took a course with Nami again, who's here. Um, it was the family to family course and it was, I think 13, 12 or 13 weeks. And every Tuesday for a few hours in the evening, we went there, losing my, um, <laughs> take these off yeah. <laughs> uh and bobby was able to learn about mental health um mental health diseases about empathy about 5150s uh crisis management all of that so i think as a partner he was so good to want to educate himself which i am blessed to have a partner like that but uh it was really important and that really helped with our marriage because it was he was just thrown into chaos and there's a podcast that we did the two of us and his number one tip was bobby what was it listen more it was listen more (laughs) i know listen listen more more. (laughs) but it's been beautiful even as your friend you know for both of you to see the deep respect and love and like the curiosity that he approaches you and the curiosity that approaches your relationship and the, it's like a lean in and -hmm. like a direct eye contact and a somatic support that he provides has been so beautiful. And it's been such an inspiration to me. Two more questions. So we did mind, we did body movement today. We did meditation. What is the connection between your mind and your body and your soul? Like how have you realized this uniquely connected being over time and realize that it's all connected (sighs) movement makes you present movement gives you those this you know the hormones that you need to make you happy right like we need to move i always say like if i don't if it goes three days and i don't move my body i feel like shit but then meditation and i mean it's all full circle So, I mean, and even like in today's practice, I just, I really use movement now and it's changed for me over the years from like hit. I'm like, don't make me do a jump squat. I mean, if you like jump squats, go on the tone it up app. They're there, but (laughs) come to tone body, tone mind apartment. I can't be jumping. (laughs) I'm like, I'd be jumping on my neighbors. (laughs) I just need like mindful movement flowing through where you're like literally bringing presence because it's so important to be present in your body and your surroundings. So that's what fitness has become for me now is more mindfulness approach to it. Yeah. And listening to your body instead of fighting against it or making it something that you don't want it to be and really appreciating and respecting it. So now that everyone has the book and they're going to go home and read it, what is one thing that you want them to take away from it when they dig into it? That you can do anything. Anything. Now I'm going to cry again. But no, it's like, again, like I said earlier, I didn't think I would make it past my 20s. 41 and I have the best life a beautiful husband five amazing Pomeranians that bark a lot <laughs> I like I like them all but skunk <laughs> <laughs> um and I have this book and I have this mission to help others heal because even though I again I'm up here crying and tearing up it's because I'm I'm so happy I'm so proud And nobody deserves to suffer in silence. It's that's, that's it. Like you can do anything. Let's give her a hand. Before we get off, let's do, let's just do a little check-in now that we've been talking so much about the mind, body, soul, it'd be nice to just end with a little hand over heart, eyes closed moment. Um, You know, you've been up here looking at us, but we want to remember the person that's within. So we can just take a quick second to close our eyes, put our hand over our heart. Maybe take a deep breath in. And maybe we add a little soft smile to the face. 
with the hand over the heart, we can feel the body. We can feel what's here, the love that's available. Just allowing any points of information or inspiration to sink in, to use that in your day, in your week. Allowing anything else to just drop off. Maybe taking this last second to tell yourself how proud you are of yourself for showing up today, for showing up for your friends, for your community, for your career. You all do so much, so, so, so much. Sending love out to everyone at this event, to everyone in the world and to ourselves. Taking one more deep breath in and sigh it out. (sighs) Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Thank you all so much for your hearts and for your attention today. I'm really excited for you to dig into this book. It is so powerful. Thank you to Karina Dawn, creator of The Big Silence, founder of Tone It Up. We are so grateful for the way you show up in the world, for the courage that you have, for the truth that you have, and for never giving up. You know, there's so many times you could have given up, but without you, we wouldn't be here today. So we love you so much. Let's give her one more hand. Thank you. And if there's anyone who wants to share their silence and walk forward, you're welcome to now. If not, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, if there's anyone who wants to share their story, we're open. Okay, are open. you open? No. Okay. Would you say? Okay. No. Well, we're always here. Can we get that big silence theme song rocking? Oh, yes. And enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Woohoo. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be signing. Where are my signing books? Emily, Stacy, come on, girls. <laughs> yes. And you guys can meet Karina, get pictures, and she'll be signing books right over there for y'all. Make sure you grab your the goodie bag. Oh, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. We will see you. And healing lives. We are no longer silent. We are here. The big silence. Mm-hmm. Breathe in, breathe out. is golden manifest and spoken through the third eye oh my i'm so open no longer silent this is the moment only one life gotta live for the moment meditate 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 levitate 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 meditate 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 levitate 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 the big silence mm-hmm. breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out the big silence mm-hmm. breathe in breathe out Mental health is my wealth, the stress up on the shelf. Nobody can love me the way I love myself. Seek and ye shall find the truth and the light. I'm living my purpose, so I sleep good at night. No more depression, a spiritual recession. And every day that I wake up, it's a blessing. So breathe in, breathe out. Everybody in the house know what I'm talking about. Come on! And right about now, it's time to sing. You are the choir of humanity. I need you to sing love with me. That's self love. Yeah, here we go. One, two, three, sing it. Here's to radical self love. The type of love that will defeat anxiety. The type of love that defeats depression. This is the one life. This is the moment. This is the time to dig in, to be who you already are. The big silence. Breathe in, breathe out. 
breathe in, breathe out. The big silence, breathe.